Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the A-level biology topics. This is eukaryotic and prokaryotic cell structure and function. The first part is observing cells. Of course, we're going to be using microscopy. Microscopes are categorized into light microscopes as well as electron microscopes. Before we do this, we have to learn two terminologies. One is magnification, which is a measure of how bigger an image is compared to the specific object. And then resolution, which is a measure of how far apart two objects must be before they are seen separately. The two types of microscopes have different specifications. Light microscopes can magnify an object up to 1,500 times. However, electron microscopes have the capability of magnifying until 500,000 times. Of course, not all electron microscopes are going to reach this, but there is potential for some electron microscopes. For electron microscopes, they use a beam of electrons why the specimen is going to be placed in a vacuum. So there is a lot of preparation that should occur when samples are being prepared to be used in an electron microscope in comparison to a light microscope. Electron microscopes include the scanning electron microscope or sometimes called ACM and the transmission electron microscope, sometimes called TEM. Again, these two microscopes, the STEM and TM, have different imagery as well as different magnifications. So the TEM images are going to be two-dimensional, but they're going to have high magnification in comparison to the scanning electron microscope. They should be SEM. The SEM micrographs are 3D and they're very striking. However, their magnification is going to be a little bit lower in comparison to that of the TEM micrographs. These are the two examples we have here. Of course, you can see the light microscope. This uses light. It's going to be a source of light while the electron microscope uses an electron source. There is more preparation involving the sample in the electron microscope in comparison to the light microscope. There is an eyepiece lens. Here we have an objective lens and then the source of light, the place where the sample is going to be placed. And uh, here the sample is going to be placed in a vacuum. When you use an electron microscope, we use a vacuum. The light microscope has advantages as well as disadvantages. It's going to be cheap in comparison or cheaper in comparison to the electron microscope. It is portable, meaning it can be carried into field studies and it can be used to observe different parts of plants and animal tissues without excessive preparation procedures. The disadvantages are it has limited resolution. The resolution is quite low in comparison to the others and due to staining and preservation methods, it's going to lead to artifacts being produced. And these artifacts could be mistaken as cellular components when they actually are not. Moving on to the electron microscope, like we already said, the advantages are it has greater magnification, it has greater resolution, so a lot of details are going to be seen from the cell itself. However, the disadvantages are it's very expensive, it's very large and so hard to carry in field studies, also, the sample has to go through excessive preparation processes, and this could lead to artifacts. And lastly, the samples are going to be examined in vacuum, and it's going to be harder for the person carrying out the microscopy to look at the living material during the observation process. In using microscopes, we have to stain, or some staining agents are going to be used. And there are different staining agents depending on the different components of the cells that are to be viewed. For example, methylene blue as a staining agent is used to stain the nuclei, of animal cells and these are going to stain blue color. Acetylchemine, this stains chromosomes in dividing nuclei of both plant and animal cells. There is hematoxylene which stains the nuclei and these are going to stain purple, blue or brown. There are also other staining agents not included here so whichever you choose provided that is staining that specific component that you want to visualize that is going to be acceptable. In part two, we go to common structures in eukaryotic cells. Here, we're going to be looking at plant as well as animal cells. Uh, this is a basic structure of a eukaryotic cell. Of course, there is a cell membrane, there is a cytoplasm, and there is a nucleus. Of course, this is going to have a nuclear membrane. All eukaryotic cells have these basic structures. This is a typical animal cell. Components include membranes. We have the cell membrane as well as internal membranes around organelles. These membranes are made up of phospholipid bilayers. The next part is the protoplasm, which is the cytoplasm as well as the organelles contained inside. Then we go to the nucleus, which is what you see here. 
the nucleus is usually in most organisms is going to be the largest organelle in the cell it's usually spherical in shape and surrounded by a double nuclear membrane with pores or nuclear holes through which certain substances that have to enter the nucleus or go out have to pass through inside the nucleus there is dna rna as well as some proteins some of these proteins are going to be enzymes carrying out certain processes in the nucleus dna is going to be bound onto proteins called histones and this is going to form chromatin because the nucleus contains the dna it controls everything that takes place within the specific cell in the nucleus there is at least one nucleolus which is a dense area of almost pure dna and protein the mitochondria is an organelle and is membrane bound it has an inner membrane and an outer membrane the inner membrane is kind of folded to form a cristae the cristae is highly folded to increase the surface area for reactions that take place there and these are reactions of aerobic respiration inside there is specific circular dna we can see the matrix as well as the intermembrane space the intermembrane space is the space between the two membranes and there is some ribosome for protein synthesis inside the mitochondrion the next one is the centrioles centrioles usually occur in pairs inside the nucleus and each consists of bundles of fibers which are usually of nine sets per tubule the centrioles are involved in cell division where they move to opposite ends of the cell as the cell is going through mitosis or meiosis in order to form spindle fibers and these spindle fibers will attach onto the centromere in order for sister chromatids to be separated during anaphase centrioles can be shown to you in this manner or in this manner but please remember this image here because this is what they usually bring in the exams and they ask you what is that you have to know these are going to be the centrioles they can be given to you in this way that way or that way so don't forget that next we look at the 80s and 70s ribosomes ribosomes are structures where protein synthesis occurs these are made of ribosomal rna as well as protein and they consist of a large subunit and a small subunit of course in eukaryotic cells these mainly contain the 80s ribosomes but the 80s comprise the 40s which is a smaller subunit and a large subunit which is the 80s in the ADS ribosome, the ratio of RNA to protein is going to be 1 to 1. The other type of ribosome is the 70S ribosomes, which are usually found in prokaryotic cells. This consists, of course, of a small and a large subunit. The small subunit is the 30S, and the large subunit is the 50S subunit. In the 70S ribosomes, the ratio of RNA to protein is going to be 2 to 1. Next, we'll look at the lysosomes. So these are important in the breakdown of phagocytosis of food in single-celled organisms, as well as for destruction of worn-out cells in your body. Lysosomes are spherical, and they are found in the cytoplasm of most cells. They contain a mixture of digestive enzymes, of course. And lysosomes are very important in programmed cell death, known as apoptosis. Programmed cell death could occur if the cell is infected, or if there is a mutation, as well as in situations where cancer cells form. In part 3, we're going to look at protein transport. The endoplasmic reticulum, or its network, links membranes around the nucleus and is divided into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, like you see here, contains a lot of small particles stuck onto them, and these particles are the ribosomes. It means this is going to be involved in protein synthesis. So we see the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to be covered with the ADS ribosomes, and uh, this increases the large surface area for synthesis of proteins. The rough ER then stores and transports the proteins within the cell. The other is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is not covered in ribosomes. This is going to be involved in the synthesis and transport of lipids as well as steroids. Oh, by the way, in exams, they can ask you to draw and label. So please learn how to draw the smooth as well as rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you have to remember these are called the cisternes. Next, we go to the Golgi apparatus, and this is involved in the packaging as well as transportation outside the cell. So the Golgi apparatus is made up of stacks of flattened membrane packets formed by vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum. These are coming off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, packaged proteins, and then these are transported, and they become part of the cisternae of the Golgi apparatus. So proteins are going to be modified as they are transported through the Golgi apparatus, 
and later they can be packaged for exocytosis to occur. And sometimes carbohydrate groups are going to be added to form proteins like glycoproteins, which include mucus. In the exam, they can ask you to draw and show how the Golgi apparatus works. You have to draw the cisternes of the Golgi apparatus in this manner. At least they have to show some bending on either side. So this is receiving the vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and these are going to be the excretory vesicles pinching off from the cisterne of the Golgi apparatus in order to carry the proteins that have been modified for exocytosis. So you have to show the cis end as well as the trans end in your drawing. Next, we go to prokaryotic cells. So here we begin by looking at a typical bacteria cell. It contains a flagellum, which allows movement. There's some photosynthetic membranes because some bacteria are photosynthetic. There is a nucleoid, which is a long circular strand of DNA. Some bacteria do have plasmids. Bacteria have cell walls. They have the 70S ribosomes, of course, for protein synthesis. They have glycogen granules, as well as lipid droplets. There is a mesosome, pili, as well as the cell surface membrane. Now I'm going to look at the different components of bacteria cells, beginning with the bacteria cell walls. All bacteria do have a cell wall. This is going to be for protection from excessive uptake of water that could cause them to bust. The cell wall also maintains the bacteria shape, giving it support and protection to the contents of the cell. This cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan, making it have a net-like structure. Some bacteria, not all, but some do have a capsule around their cell walls for protection from phagocytosis by white blood cells. The capsule covers the cell markers on the cell membrane that identify the cells, so phagocytosis may not occur. Next, we go to other structures like the pili and the flagella. Pili are thread-like proteins found on the surface of bacterium, and sometimes they're used for attachment to the host or for sexual reproduction. And again, when we say sexual reproduction, we mean conjugation, exchange of genetic material, not actual sexual reproduction like in other organisms. The flagella are made up of multi-stranded helix of protein called flagellin. These allow the bacterium to move because the flagellum is going to be rapidly rotated for faster movement. The next one, we go to the 70S ribosome. This contains a larger subunit and a smaller subunit. The smaller subunit is the 30S, while the larger one is the 50S. And these are going to be involved in protein synthesis in a similar way we saw in eukaryotic ribosomes. The cell surface membrane, this is similar in function as well as composition like we saw in eukaryotic cells. It's a phospholipid bilayer. The nucleoid, this is an area of the bacteria cell where DNA tango is going to be formed. Some cells do have plasmids, which are smaller circles of DNA. And this code for aspects of the bacterial phenotype. This could be antibiotic resistance. It could be any other gain advantage that they code for. And of course, these plasmids are going to be replicated when the nucleoid is also replicated. Going on to gram staining and bacterial cell walls, we have gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria. The cell walls of gram positive bacteria have thick peptidoglycan and this contains thicoic acid within the neck like structure. You can see this is the peptidoglycan layer, which is really thick, and there is tachoic acid. The crystal violet or iodine in gram stain is trapped within these thick layers, and it resists discoloring on dehydration when ethanol is used. So when counter stain like safranine is used, these do not pick it up, and so they will appear blue or purple when viewed in a light microscope. For gram-negative bacteria, these have a smaller peptidoglycan layer, as you can see, and there is no tachoic acid. Also, the outer membrane is made up of lipopolysaccharides. You see these are lipids. So when an alcohol or ethanol is used during the dehydration process, that is going to be dissolved. I'm talking about the lipopolysaccharide is going to be dissolved. So the peptidoglycan layer is going to be exposed to the crystal violet stroke iodine complex, and this is going to be washed out. So the peptidoglycan will then take up the counter stain and it's going to appear red when viewed in a light microscope. So in simple terms, these are going to stain red and these are going to remain blue or purple when gram stain is used. Next, we go to other ways of classifying bacteria instead of classifying them as gram positive or gram negative. 
We can also classify them based on their respiratory requirements. For example, we have the obligate aerobes. Because they're aerobes, meaning they need oxygen, so these need oxygen in order to carry out respiration and survive. Without oxygen, they will not survive. Then we have the facultative anaerobes. These can use oxygen if it's available, however, they can respire anaerobically too. And then the obligate anaerobes, these do not need oxygen, they only respire in the absence of oxygen, and sometimes presence of oxygen could kill them. The last method of classification is based on their shape. Of course, like we see here, there is the cosi, which are spherical, there is the bacilli, which are rod-like, there is the vibrio, which are coma-like, and then we have the spirilla, which are twisted in shape. In topic 3A5, we look at the organizations of cells. Eukaryotic cells can be arranged to create tissues, and various tissues can be arranged to create organs. Various organs come together to create an organ system, and then many organ systems come together to create an organism. Going to tissues, tissues are groups of cells that evolve from the same kind of cell. They are cells that are similar and perform the same function. There are many types of tissues. There are epithelial tissues, connective tissue, muscle tissue, as well as nervous tissues. However, the examples we are looking at here are the epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues include the simple squamash, these are usually found in blood vessels or they line blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, as well as lining of the heart. When we go to cuboido, these are found in ducts as well as secretory portions of small glands as well as the kidneys. The ciliated line the trachea as well as cells close to make a secretion. The glandula are found in areas where secretions do occur. This could include the inner layer of the skin where sebum is produced as well as around mucus secreting cells like we can see this is mucus being secreted from the goblet cells. The composites shredded are found in continually scratched and abraded surfaces for example the skin. That's why we see many layers and they're rapidly dividing in order to regenerate the cells that have been abraded. When we go to organs, organs of the body include the liver, the small intestine, the large intestine, the stomach, the heart, the brain and so on. So an organ is a structure made of several different tissues grouped together and they perform the same function or a particular function. Organs can be found in animals as well as plants and for the plant organs we can see the leaf. The leaf is a plant organ. Inside this leaf we can see the vessels like the xylem as well as the phloem. We see the spongy cells as well as the palisade cells. These are cells making different tissues to perform different functions. Of course, other plant organs include the stem as well as the roots. The organ system, these include many systems like the digestive system, the circulatory system, the gaseous exchange system. Those are all different systems because they contain several organs working together to perform a specific function. So this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.